Hello my friends, I'm Kayla. This is my April wrap up. I read, hold on, 24 things this month. Here are my stats. I don't talk through them until we're a quarter, a quarter more through. Every three months I talk about these. I recently did a quarterly update. If you want me to talk, if you want to watch me talk through my stats from the first three months of the year, it's going to be two more months until we do it again. Uh, but here's just some general numbers. Anyway, I haven't organized a way to talk about all of these books yet. What I was thinking is I do have a really good mix, almost a perfect mix, I feel, of three stars, four stars, and five stars. So maybe I can lump them all into groups of three. And in each one, there will be a book I didn't like, a book I liked, and a book I loved. And I'm using didn't like loosely because three stars is still a decent rating. <laughs> Easy first decision first. These three were all book club reads that I read in April. So we have The Spite House by Johnny Compton for the Literally Dead Book Club that I gave three stars. Uh, the Book of Swords edited by Gardner Dozwa that I read for the Busy Bee Book Club that I gave four stars. And The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz, which again I read for the Literally Dead Book Club and I gave five stars. So The Spite House is a horror thriller. It feels like a paranormal investigation story to me following this man and his two daughters who are kind of on the run but we don't know what from and they're looking for any and every opportunity somewhere to live some way to make money and this opportunity presents itself where he can stay in this house and record all of the paranormal goings on and then he'll get a big check at the end. It made for an interesting story because there were a lot of POVs. This is somewhere in the threes like I don't know if it's a 3.25 or a 3.5 or where it really lands because I've been thinking about this book a lot lately and I just don't know that that it's super memorable. So it has an interesting premise and it's interesting to follow fast paced because there are so many points of view. We get Eric and both of his daughters and then the person who like owns the house, somebody in the past who owned the house, various other people who've experienced the house, even the people who came before Eric and his family who experienced something scary in the house. So there are moments of tension, but you leave them very quickly because there are so many points of view. It had an element I don't always love, which is finding out a lot of things before the characters, and a bulk of the book is waiting for them to figure out what you already know. There were definitely some characters who were more interesting than others. I don't know that it went in like my favorite direction, but there's nothing particularly flawed about this in general. So that's why my rating is where it is. The Book of Swords, uh, this is a bunch of short stories. The theme being swords means that a lot of the stories are about like somebody wielding a sword. So there are great descriptions of swords, sword making. Some of them felt more on theme than others. Uh, the first one that kicked the whole thing off, KJ Parker's The Best Man Wins, was one of my favorite short stories I've ever read. It made me really care when I hadn't before about making swords. You know, I'm not known for being an epic fantasy girl, but I do love an anthology and I have read Dangerous Women and Rogues. I also have the Book of Magic on my TBR. So these 20 to 50 page experiences were definitely in my wheelhouse, even though I probably wouldn't pick up a whole like trilogy about somebody with a sword. Another one of my favorites was The Hidden Girl by Ken Liu, which was about like assassins and empathy. I really liked The Mocking Tower by Daniel Abraham, which was about princes and their father um, was like turned into a sword and he was in this tower. They had to decide if they wanted to go get him, destroy the sword or what. Uh, when I Was a Highwayman by Ellen Kushner was so fantastic. I think that he did a great job of organizing this collection, putting them in the right order because there was like a really high action story right before this one and then a really high action one right after. So this being more of a silly, fun, almost cozy fantasy slipped in there was just such a nice reprieve. And it was about this guy who works as a duelist. So he goes to weddings and performs and also protects like brides. And there are a couple of relationships he gets into. He ends up uh, robbing somebody. It was a really fun time. And then I also gave the Coal Grid Conundrum by Rich Larson five stars, which is about like two men and they're trying to open this treasure chest and they want to share it with this woman because she can open it, but she asks them to complete a task for her instead. And I would totally read a novella series about those like two men and their journeys that they go on. It introduced me to a couple authors that I, I, I might be interested in reading more from. There are some like short story collections from individual authors featured in here that I think I would pick up. And that's kind of always my goal from anthology is being introduced to new people. So it did that. And we've got The Writing Retreat by Julia Bartz, which I know was 
all over the place for so many people. Uh, for me, this was like a thriller with some horror elements. And it took place at this writing retreat where this famous, um, super intriguing woman is putting on an event for just a couple select women who have written stories that intrigue her. This is meant to be kind of an experimental event where she brings them all in and she sees what they can accomplish in a month and she puts them outside of their comfort zone. At first it sounds like it'll be a fun opportunity and then you can tell that Rosa, the person putting it on, is completely unhinged from the start and then the plot also meets up with that as we go on. It has an incredible setup, the first half of this just getting to the house, getting to know all of the girls. There's no even mystery presented at the beginning except like the backstory between some maybe there's like a toxic friendship going on and then the plot from there really goes off the rails there is uncomfortable sex scenes there's ridiculous villainous monologues and then there's even a story within the story that one of the women is writing it leans a little supernatural so it feels like the story itself becomes a little supernatural. The two things that I've said over and over again I look for in a thriller is I want to be entertained and I want to be surprised this delivered on both of those and then also didn't do anything to like bother me and then there was tons of twists and turns so it was just kind of my perfect thriller even though I can see from an objective perspective that it's not perfect. I don't know if that makes sense but those are my three book club things that I read, a variety of ratings and I'll link all of the live shows down below. My next group of three is going to be magic books. They're not the only magic books here but that's just what I've decided. So we've got all of Us Villains by Amanda Foodie and Christine Lynn Herman, that was a three star. A Darker Shade of Magic by V.E. Schwab, that was a four star. And Half a Soul by Olivia Atwater, which was a five. All of Us Villains is a YA fantasy where there are seven families who compete regularly to see like who's gonna control the magic for the next allotted amount of time. We're focused on like four main characters who are participating. And this year is a little bit different because it's a little more public. It used to be like this secret underground experience and now more people know about it. So there's more opportunity for each of the competitors to look into the other competitors. Like it's more publicized so they can find out like what other competitions have looked like in the past, what people's strategies might be, what their family dynamic looks like. I think the main thing it comes down to for me is the pace. I like a competition story. I don't know that the competition itself happened over a period of time that I enjoyed. The lead up to the competition was a fine amount of time, but then not the amount of time, like not within the book, but in the physical world that the competition took place in. And then there was this like time jump um, that we didn't really get insight into as much as I would have wanted. Uh, and then there was also this like, I think one or two flashback kind of scenes um, that felt it felt like there should have been more and maybe if I read the entire duology like more characters would get a flashback scene so everyone felt kind of equal because I definitely felt like the authors had a preference for certain characters and a focus got put on different ones than maybe. I just don't find that they were the most memorable to me overall. They weren't as a group as villainous as I was expecting. Maybe I was expecting more of an adult premise or by the end I had hoped it would be more adult and it would be more gruesome and it would get a little more I don't know I don't want to say just interesting because it was generally interesting like this is a three it was just okay a month from now I'm not gonna remember anything about it I'm already on that path right now. The Darker Shade of Magic is also part of a bigger story I think I'll continue in it but I don't know when so in here we've got Kel, our main character, who is like a smuggler, and he has magical abilities to go between these different Londons. So it's kind of alternate universes where in some Londons, like magic exists, some it doesn't, or some people know about it. In some, the world has been destroyed by its magic. And then we meet like an equally important character, Lila, who is a thief and they come into contact in an interesting way and she learns about magic through him. They're both like kind of hesitant towards each other, but very interesting characters to follow, the relationship that builds. I didn't know what the vibe of this was gonna be and I still don't know what the overall vibe of the entire series is. Like, am I supposed to feel like romance vibes? Am I supposed to take it as just an action story? Like, is this the beginning of magic? ending? Is this Kel's story that's going to end by the end? Like I just don't really know a lot of the purpose. I don't really get a feeling for what 
it is doing, but I know that I was liking it and I like learning about all of this stuff. Kel is a character who's really respected and important in a lot of people's eyes and the way they treat him is interesting and there's a lot of inner turmoil that he wades through and I'm most interested to follow that emotional journey throughout the series and I can't imagine where the plot is even going to go from here. This felt like a solid arc but also very incomplete as an experience for me. So yeah, four. This is definitely the month that I feel like I've had the most subjective opinions and I need to recognize that like publicly because giving half a soul five stars when this one was a four kind of feels wrong to me because this story, I don't know that you would say felt as um, intentional with its world building or as you know, maybe well researched or planned out. It's not as consistent, perhaps. But there was just something about it that was so incredibly charming to me. And I gave it five stars. So we're following this girl, Theodora. It's a Regency fairy story, which is not really my wheelhouse. She is a human being. And um, she comes into contact with a fairy who steals half of her soul. And now there are, is this magical Kind of man that she meets who is a potential suitor for her regency we're dealing with like the push to find a proper suitor get in with a good family one of those men that she meets has magic and he is gonna look into if he can figure out like what has happened to her how to get her soul back so it had this really fun back and forth between dora and elias that i just loved so much i found uh, their dislike to like really fun to follow. They ha are forced together in a certain way. There was this magical mystery present and this illness that was affecting like factory workers. And so there was a lot of also conversation of like checked privilege and helping others. And all in all things I would say from an objective standpoint wrapped up too easily. It was all a little bit surface level, like for the most part it was surface level, but it, and I, but I wouldn't say that like the romance took over the entire plot and it was this epic sweeping romance. I think I just really felt why these characters should be together. So I was rooting for them the entire time. I don't think this is going to work for everyone, but there was just something about it uh, that I loved so much. Kind of a cozy, cozy adjacent fantasy romance. On to my next group of three. Those ones made sense thematically. This one, I just grabbed three for the vibes. I feel like these covers are a really nice combination. So my three star is Before I Let Go by Kennedy Ryan. My four star is The Soulmate Equation by Christina Lauren. But if I really looked at these side by side weeks after reading them, I think they're probably a more similar rating than I originally decided upon. And then the five star is Kakei by Vishnavi Patel. Before I Let Go is a romance between recently divorced people and um, they decide to get back together even though they have just thrown their children through a loop. They're gonna do it again because they've realized that they still should be together. Was I convinced of that? not so much. I can appreciate so much about this. I feel like I would recommend this to so many people. Uh, the reason that this relationship fell apart, uh, they went through a lot of grief together, uh, experienced trauma, and uh, our main character, whose name I don't remember, Yasmin, uh, she felt like she wasn't worthy of love. She felt a lot of pain and anguish internally and had a lot to work through and didn't feel like she was getting the support she needed but wasn't reaching out for the support she needed and just needed to be on her own. I think her story is going to be relatable to a lot of people and the journey of self-worth and feeling worthy of love from others is going to be like it is a good arc to follow. It's generally a more sentimental romance than what I'm looking for but I picked it up in a way that my TBR was decided for me. I don't think this type of romance is something that I really need to dissect or needs to be dissected in general. Uh, it's just something that I feel can be impactful for a lot of people. Wasn't for me. I found it too stressful to enjoy the romantic portions of, but I know that that's not a common feeling for everyone. Uh, the Soulmate Equation was the 
fun um, kind of silly romance I was looking for. But at the end of the day, like, should this really be a four? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's just because of what else I was reading that week and what I needed. This hit all of the beats that you expect it to, and it was really predictable. But the relationship at the heart of it, again, was a dislike to like. And maybe it was just a dynamic that I enjoyed. Uh, so we have this DNA service that matches you with your perfect partner based on your DNA. It ends up being a love story between the single mom named Jessica who's being open to more new experiences and the creator of the like app experience itself who hasn't been matched with somebody or nobody's been matched to this percentage before so they're thrust into the spotlight together because it's this kind of needing to prove that the service is really going to be successful and look at these two people who are perfectly dna matched they are going to be in reality matched perfectly as well. With that comes a lot of questions of like, is this person authentically interested in me or does he just want his app to be successful? They have a dating for convenience plan in place and it was just, there was nothing wrong with it. And I liked them together enough to give it the rating that it did. Then my five star Kaikei, this was recommended um, because of Circe. And I would say this was the perfect mix between Circe and Daughter of the Moon Goddess. So just like five star, five star, five star. In it, we're following Kekei through many years of her life, from being a young child, just discovering her magic, um, to having a marriage chosen for her and becoming a mother. I hate to spoil like the entire plot of this, so I struggled to, with what to talk about, but I think my favorite thing is learning about the magic and seeing the different roles that she chooses for herself. Uh, she has a lot of decisions to make in regards to the influence that she has. So her magical ability is briefly explained by these threads that she can create between her and people and she can see how strong these bonds are and wh when they snap. And um, it's a kind of compulsion so she can convince people to do what she wants and that could easily corrupt a person. Um, but also she has influence just as far as her kind of royal status and she is helping other women in communities, building a group of them to make decisions so the men don't have all of the power. And there's just a lot of fun things to follow. Maybe not fun. Fun's not the right word. There are interesting things to follow. And then the storyline just like goes in a certain direction with certain characters. And there's a lot of decisions to be made. I'll just leave it at that. Five stars, a fantastic time. Okay, this next trio. Oh, I grabbed these two because they have guide in the title. And then this one, maybe they're kind of uh, futuristic, weird, like partially real world, but partially something else vibes. What do you think about that? At three stars, The Guide by Peter Heller, a uh, pandemic-y kind of story. At four stars, we need to do something by Max Booth the uh, horror isolation-ish story, apocalypse, maybe. Oh wait, maybe the world is ending in all of these because the earth is being destroyed in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams, which is why he goes to space. Uh, and this was a five star. So the guide follows a man with a name and his name is Jack. <laughs> and every second line of his dialogue has to do with fishing. So the guy really loves fishing and he gets the opportunity to be a fishing guide at this like elite location. There is a global pandemic and um, there are little pockets of safety. This is one of them that has been created for people to come to and just have a reprieve from uh, the real world horrors. But little does Jack know he's entering a dangerous experience of its own. He gets there, he realizes there are cameras, he's being watched. Um, if he steps foot outside of the territory he's allowed in, something bad might happen to him. It starts out with beautiful description, lays out this fantastic atmosphere, and then travels into just ridiculous thriller vibes. It's high action. Um, and you could say that about other books that I've given higher ratings, but I think what they don't have in common is I didn't really care about Jack. I didn't find him a compelling character, um, his perspective on the world and all the people that he meets and the way he's trying to investigate like what's really going on. I just didn't really care about a lot of it, but the writing and the fun nature, like once it picked up, it was fun enough to like get a three. I think a lot of people will enjoy this. 
it was just okay for me. Uh, and I feel the opposite about this. This might be for a more specific audience. Uh, we need to do something is a, I was gonna say slow, but I might be conflating it with the movie because I watched it really soon after. Uh, it's kind of a horror story uh, of this family, this dis dysfunctional family who got, gets trapped together in their bathroom because there is a storm outside and they've been trapped. They're isolated. Um, our main character is a teenager girl and she's reflecting sometimes on things that led up to this event and how she thinks she might be responsible for like the destruction that's perhaps going on outside the bathroom, but they don't really know what's happening outside the bathroom. They can only imagine it. She also has various hallucinations and they're experiencing like horrific events within the bathroom, like uh, creatures, like animals coming in, being dangerous, each other maybe being dangerous, um, starvation, all these things that are definitely making tensions mount. I think I would have to call this cosmic horror because of the nature of where the plot goes or doesn't. It maybe wasn't as sinister as I was expecting, but it was interesting. And I really think I am mixing it up in my head with the movie because I really disliked the movie. And I'm sitting here thinking like, should this be a four? But I know I gave it a confident four in the moment. So uh, this one, a confident five. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is with this guy named Arthur and the world is ending and his alien friend takes him up into space. There's this book called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that we get introduced to. It's being edited um, by his alien friend. Various people are, contribute to it. And it's just a series of really wacky events. It's very funny and silly. There is no real purpose. Uh, these characters do not have a goal in mind. There isn't something that we're necessarily leading to and needs to be accomplished. It's just more a survival story. They're jumping from thing to thing, encountering various creatures and people who are impacting their current survival. They're learning about the origin of the galaxy. There is this super computer that's answering questions. There's interesting critiques of humanity we get to read. There's a lot of questions that you have as the reader that aren't going to get answered. Maybe like in future. This is the first in a series. It was originally a radio show. Um, I think I'll continue in the series. I don't know when, like when I would ever prioritize that. But this was so fun. It was right up my alley. Just like silly sci-fi. Now, this group of three I mean, I'm running out of books where this isn't as clear. Um, I want to say something about just like the general vibes of them. They all do talk about religion or have a religious uh, plot, like implication, suggestion, reference. My three star is A God in the Shed by J.F. Dubois. My four is Pew by Catherine Lacey. And my five is Indian Horse by Richard Wagamese. So A God in the Shed is this cosmic creature fantasy horror mixed with crime fiction. There's this detective, there's this group of officers looking into this serial killer. Um, there's been a string of deaths. And from the very first chapter, uh, we know that there is this creature entity that is in this small town. It was interesting enough to finish. I was also reading this for a video concept. Um, so you're following, you're just following a lot of different people, a lot of different things going on, looking into this like understanding this creature, how this string of events has affected this community and all the individual people who've come into contact with this evil. How I think this could have worked better is if it was a series of novellas because the beginning and the initial intrigue and the extremely well-written moments um, of the creature stuff could have been its own short story. And then finding out about the serial killer and all of the implications there um, could have been its own story. And then it introduced like four other plots in all of these people. And not in necessarily a fun way where you got all of these things connecting and then everything worked together in the end. It felt like individual stories and not everything satisfied the reader by the end, it almost felt like it left it open for sequels, which I also don't think that it needs. But it could have been split up into multiple stories and then those could have been explored each a little bit more because there was intriguing things going on, but we kept getting pulled in different directions. So if you were interested in what was currently going on, it was like, 
are we ever going to come back to this? Or are we going to learn about something completely different? I am talking myself currently into under a three. Uh, there's some cult stuff in here that for most people is probably interesting for me. It wasn't. Uh, there's some like body conversations I wasn't loving. The concept is still interesting enough and I feel like everything would be a spoiler to talk about. So that's really all I've got for you. I would suggest watching a review from a traditional like horror reader who does in-depth reviews to figure out if it's going to be the type for you or not. Then we've got Pew and Pew is this story of an unnamed narrator and we don't know and nobody in the book finds out who gets to know uh, gets insight on their race, age, sexuality, gender. Um, they're just this like confusing entity to everybody they come into contact with. Uh, so they just, all we know is they wake up in this church pew and the church people, <laughs> the people who attend the church, the community, take them into their home and want to offer them support. But pew is not willing to share what they've been through, where they've come from. Maybe they don't remember everything. And the community's perspective starts to shift on like how much help can we offer this person if they're not going to exploit themselves for our gain. There's a lot of interesting conversations. Pew is what they name the character uh, because of where they found them. It's just the perfect ambiguous little fiction that feels like it has this sinister quality to it. It's leading up to an event this big day. I can't remember what it's called, but it's like the day of forgiveness or something. It's short. It's odd. I don't think it'll be for everyone. Uh, then we've got Indian Horse, and this is the story of one child's experience, Saul. Uh, it starts when he's very young and uh, he's being taken by the Catholic Church into a residential school um, and tortured and abused and horrific things are happening obviously to all the children there. He's been stripped away from his family and um, it's just a lot of exploration of what he's witnessing and the trauma he's enduring and then also his introduction to the one thing that he has to live for which is hockey. Uh, they have like an ice rink on the premises and he teaches himself to skate and this is how he ends up escaping essentially is uh, he becomes so good that teams want to take him on and he gets to live somewhere else and have certain opportunities uh, wherever he goes, he's still experiencing absolute uh, hate and trauma continually. The story moves through his life as an adult and it even opens with like him um, acknowledging alcoholism and that he needs help for it. It's obviously an incredibly important story shedding light on something so horrific that a lot of people just ignore in Canada's history. And it's told with such skill, the descriptions and the inner turmoil that he's talking through, uh, the things that he's highlighting. It's just all so well done. It's this story of the mental and physical impact that this is always going to have regardless of where you are in your life and also finding a reason to go on. My next grouping, I think we just have to focus on the covers. Like this is just an aesthetically pleasing vibe. <laughs> this is actually my only two star of the month, I think, officially. Uh, Set on You by Amy Leah. The three something star, three point something, is shipped by Angie Hawkman. And my five star is Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone by Benjamin Stevenson. You might think I should have included like a romance section in that one I could have pulled out, but I didn't rate that so it doesn't count. In fact, the rest of the things I have up here are things I didn't rate, but I'll talk through very briefly after this group. So with Set On You, this is a rom-com um, about a fitness influencer and she meets this guy at the gym. It's a dislike to like dynamic again. I think what I've learned about me in romance is I really have to be on board with the characters. That is the most important thing to me. Second to that is the dynamic, like the banter going on. There was some like fun things happening here, but I did not like either of these characters. I didn't believe them as characters. Um, I think that she thinks herself to be much more self-aware and inclusive than she actually is and her perspective on other people and the world I, I didn't appreciate a lot of. Even though generally and the majority of the plot I'm totally on board with. She's like talking about body positivity and she's featuring a lot of 
um, the vitriol that comes in from the fitness community on social media because she is a curvier woman um, doing that type of content and she gets a lot of hate for it and she has to be self-assured and she needs to know her self-worth. She talks about that at length and that's all great. Then her dynamic with this guy and her perspective on so many things, just I just didn't enjoy her. And I felt the same about him. Like I understand other people's enjoyment of this and like appreciating their like willingness to support each other, their communicative. They've got a real like juvenile kind of back and forth. That's for somebody. It just didn't end up being for me. I think I could have enjoyed this a lot more if it was just her story. Crystal? Yeah. Crystal, it felt like it was more about her and her journey and that's totally fine but then I didn't need the romance in it. Uh, it felt like her love story not his. It was all focused on her and the journey that she was going on and everyone needed her to change and she had a lot of like trust issues to work through and I just I just didn't really love them or their dynamic. It wasn't the wild and wacky rom-com that I was hoping for. Then with Shipped I give this like a 3.5. I think I said in the video 3.75 closer to a three makes more sense now reflecting on it. Uh, I feel the same about this as I feel about like Emily Henry. Again, a lot about the main character, which makes sense when you call her the main character, Henley, but I like more of a balance between the two uh, love interests for each other, I guess. And it's so much about workplace stuff and career stuff, which is why it makes me think of Emily Henry. It also has sibling dynamics. And in here we have a dislike to like, but it's not really equal. She really does not care for him. He has no idea what's going on. Uh, they both work in like marketing at their job, but they haven't met in person. He works remote and they're both vying for this more senior position. I think what I do appreciate about this so much is the taking into account of like eco-tourism and talking about sustainability and talking about the environment. Clearly the author is well researched, has a passion for something and integrated that into the story. Uh, what I don't think was as well researched or understood or personal experience just from like my takeaways that my assumptions uh, is the marketing stuff. I It was hard for me to get past um, all of the inconsistencies with trying to understand this marketing department and how they were deciding to get these positions and their perspective on each other, especially her talking about this guy and his qualifications and why she would be better for this role. I just disagree with so much that she was saying. And a lot of it just didn't check out with the business that they were talking about and the way that I would know a marketing department like that to be structured. That definitely doesn't make or break the book for me. It's not really affecting the rating. It's just something I couldn't stop thinking about. And I'm sure that's present in so many romance books that like I don't have experience in that type of career. So I don't even notice that it doesn't make sense. What these two end up doing though, they're forced together uh, because they're going on this cruise where they haven't been on a cruise yet with the cruise company that they work for and they need to experience it. And that was fun. Them interacting with the customers on board, um, getting to know them, trying to better their advertising. I didn't necessarily love either of these characters, but I did like their relationship. They had some fun banter. I think if it was steamy, which I thought it would be and it wasn't, which was really disappointing, um, I would have given it a higher rating for sure. Then moving along to something not romantic, Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone is one of my favorite mystery books I have ever read. It is so fun. It's so different. Uh, this guy is narrating the story and he's telling us about a book that he's writing about his family and how everyone has killed someone. So the mystery plot in here is he's meeting up with his mom and dad, step people, brothers, sisters, all at this uh, family reunion in this snowy resort and somebody dies while they're there and everybody, you know, they have to talk about it. They have to solve the mystery. But a lot of the story is reflecting on Ernie, our main character's experience with each of these family members and the story of maybe who they killed. So it's divided up into my father, my mother, everybody gets their own section. And so we're following an experience, like share, just talking about that person, maybe how their lives looked in the past and also current day, their interactions. It's direct to reader. It's very fun and silly and a little pretentious feeling. He gives us a list at the beginning of like 
how to write a mystery novel, all the rules, how you're not allowed to like lie to the reader, how this has to happen and then this has to happen. And then he goes on to say, this is how I'm going to write my book to you. And here are the chapters where a death is going to occur. Here's everything. I promise I'm not unreliable. I'm going to take you through this story day by day. And it's just so unbelievably fun. I felt like it was over a little too fast. I was just getting to know these people. So it's interesting to learn that this is going to be a series. I would have such a hard time knowing who to recommend this to because it's a very distinct style but I don't think I've read anything quite like it to compare it to. I wouldn't pick it for like a thrilling book club read. I don't know that I would recommend it to classic mystery readers. I don't know though. There are just a ton of things to be revealed but they don't feel like twists. They just feel like him telling you a story. So there's like affairs and there's money and there's prison and obviously a lot of murder. And it's just so fun being along for this ride. And it's actually a TV series, it's a movie or TV series, I can't remember, that I will actually watch, which doesn't happen all a lot. And then these ones all went technically unrated by me. Most of them are childhood rereads for my 12th grade, but it was like a mix of things. And then I didn't allow myself to rate Pestilence because I, I was just having a really successful video and the goal of the video would have also been ruined if I said out loud that I didn't like this. So let me just tell you about Pestilence by Laura Thalass. It's the first book in the Four Horsemen series where Pestilence is obviously this uh, entity that is bringing the end of days. And we're following a girl named Sarah, a woman named Sarah, and she decides along with some of her friends that she's gonna be the one to kill Pestilence. So when he comes to town, because there's this plague sweeping the world, um, it's been happening for a couple years and it's eventually has come to their area and she's gonna kill him. So she tries to do that shocking he's a god essentially and doesn't succeed and therefore he's mad and takes her as his captive and tortures her and then they kiss a lot <laughs> no there is a lot going on um they're traveling to different places together he, as he puts the illness upon the world and throughout the story he gets introduced to humanity from sarah learns about humans which he's never done before starts to build empathy maybe you could say. I mean of all the romance that I read this month this is the relationship that I would actually say is the biggest yikes. The writing was um rough. Sarah has very interesting maybe like Bella Swan humor. It was cringy, it was weird, but I chose to put myself in the mindset of somebody who reads that type of thing and loves it. And so I finished it. I did finish it. And then my childhood rereads were Red Sky at Morning by Richard Bradford, which is about a teenager moving to a new town with his family. Coming of age story. Um, the war is involved and it wasn't as good as I remember. Uh, Animal Farm by George Orwell. Also war times connected political uh, influence, obviously, about a farm that has become controlled by the animals themselves. Some animals have more power than others. Loved it. Love, love Animal Farm. Uh, the Chocolate Touch by Patrick Skeen Catling is about this guy. What's his name? Patrick? Nope, that's the author. John. <laughs> John Midas, who everything he touches turns to chocolate because he's eaten too much chocolate and has become chocolate and has been cursed with chocolate. It was fun. The Watcher by James Howe was not quite what I remember, but it was interesting about a girl who watches some other people and wishes she had their life. Uh, she's going through some s tough stuff and it's more so about the people that she's watching and the two boys and their personal experiences in life. And lastly, The Secret World of Og by Pierre Burton, uh, which is this story written by him, illustrated by his daughter, and it follows this group of children who go into this underground world to find their missing brother. Uh, there's all of these green creatures they encounter and they don't know if they're good or they're bad. Uh, one of the kids paints himself green to join the community and they just have to figure it all out. Wouldn't really recommend it over any other kind of Narnia Alice in Wonderland 
children's classic, but it was a nostalgic read for me. So that is everything that I read in April. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know your perspective on any of these. If you liked something more than me, if you liked it less, that's fine. Um, if you want to read any of these now, I don't know. I don't know. Let me know any of your thoughts and I'll read them. Okay, bye. I love you as a friend.